following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The training of meditation is very long and requires a great deal of study and practical experience in order to understand what meditation truly is. It's not something that you can acquire by attending a meditation class once a week. You will never, ever understand it. The experience of real meditation is something that emerges in your consciousness once the proper conditions have been established. And so in these recent lectures, we've been discussing what those conditions are. You may have attended other meditation lectures or retreats or practices or classes and encountered um, the normal or, or a sort of common approach which is to go immediately into a lot of technical aspects such as proper posture and preliminary concentration practices and uh, the use of mantra and all of these are important but really they are a step that that comes after a first step. Traditionally, if you were to be a student of a of a lineage such as Zen or Raja Yoga or Tibetan Buddhism, for example, you wouldn't be introduced to these types of materials, the, the technical details until you've had preliminary training, the very first training, which can extend for quite a long time, and that is training in ethics. And of course, nowadays, especially North Americans and Europeans, who are very intellectual by nature, think that we get that already that ethics is easy and we can skip on to the next steps. But of course, this is the one of the main causes for why North Americans and Europeans fail to learn how to meditate. Schools of meditation have been active in Western countries for many decades now. Even though meditation was known and practiced amongst the natives of the Americas, uh, it wasn't brought with the Europeans when they came. And so the practice and science of meditation was lost in the Western Hemisphere for a long time. But with the arrival of the Asian wisdom, which started arriving more or less 100 years ago, Meditation began to reemerge as a topic of interest amongst Westerners, particularly in uh, those who were um, had lost faith in their traditional religions.
But unfortunately, the real practice and science of meditation has not gained a strong foothold in the culture. It's not that people are unaware of it. Most people have heard of the term meditation. What's hard to find is someone who has sincere realization from meditation. This is very difficult to find. You can easily find teachers in schools. But to find someone who has practical knowledge that has emerged out of meditation practice, this is very rare. It's easy to find scholars and people who are well-versed in the terminology or in the scriptures or who have studied comparative religions, may have even translated lots of different texts. But none of that is real knowledge. None of that is conscious knowledge that stays with the soul when that soul moves into a new existence. This is something that I wanted to emphasize because I know in our study of meditation and the way that we approach the subject, it could be easy to take it intellectually and to just um, assume that we already know some of this because we may have heard some of the terms. The measure that you have to apply to yourself as to whether you really understand meditation is if you have experience in meditation, not intellectual information, not just an understanding of how the words and terms work, but actual experience consciously of the states that the terms describe. In the first lecture of these lectures about meditation, I talked to you a little bit about wisdom. And we talked about the Pranya Paramita Sutra, which is potentially one of the most important scriptures in Asia, in any Asian tradition, certainly in Buddhism. And that scripture describes something deeply profound, even though it's quite short. Pranya, wisdom. It may be the most commented upon scripture in Buddhism. More commentaries and references to that short passage than any other scripture. And yet, to truly understand it is something that is very difficult to achieve. Fortunately, the founder of our tradition had practical experience with the nature of that sutra. He experienced it as young as the age of 18. He entered into the experience of prana, of knowing what that means, wisdom. You see, this wisdom is not the ability to uh, recite platitudes. In the West, we tend to think of wisdom as, as uh, clever phrases stated by a person with gray hair or seated on a throne or at a pulpit. That is not wisdom. Wisdom in the context of Gnosis is hokmah. This is a Hebrew term that refers to the second sephirah on the tree of life, hokmah, wisdom. In Sanskrit, the equivalent term is pranya. This is a kind of intelligence that is one of the faces of God. It is far beyond the intellect. And that is the, the very essence or force that emerges in the heart and mind of a true bodhisattva. Someone like Jesus, or Buddha, or Krishna. The light that comes from their eyes, and through their words, and through their actions, is prana. And this is a kind of intelligence that is revolutionary. It is far beyond the recitation of the commandments, or the remembrance of the vows, or the repetition of morality. 
Pranya is a penetrating wisdom that cuts through appearances. You see, we only see appearances. We don't see the truth of a given thing. We see our body and we assume this is my body and we take it for granted. We don't see the body itself. We're not cognizant, conscious of what's happening in the body, even at this instant. Of the billions of atoms that are all active and working. Of all the systems and, and marvelous processes that are unfolding within the physical body. We don't even see that. It's the most superficial level. Because deeper than that, your body is mostly empty space. It is mostly nothing. To actually perceive that, to be aware of that, takes a type of insight, perception, prana. This is the type of wisdom that Hokma imparts. It is a kind of insight, consciousness. Not just the thought of something or remembrance of something, but the perception of it. It's a perception that cuts through appearances to see the truth, not just of the body, but of the heart, of the mind, of how to behave, of how to act, of how to love. This is the greatest gift that prana can give us, that wisdom can give us. How to love. That is the doctrine of a bodhisattva, the way of life of a bodhisattva. That every single motion that they make is for love of others, for the benefit of others. Prana or wisdom gives that. In our tradition, the Gnostic tradition, that is what we want. That wisdom. We don't care about memorizing texts or conforming to a rigid structure of moral, or moral behaviors. These have nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with the truth. The truth is something that lives, that comes alive in one's heart and mind. It's something that one has to create conditions so that that light can emerge in the soul. And this is why we learn to meditate. In, to, in Buddhism, traditional Buddhism, it's said that there are three trainings to arrive at this. Wisdom is the third training. In order to create the psychological and spiritual environment within which that wisdom can emerge in our consciousness, we need concentration. And this is not a superficial concentration. This is a having a mind that is undisturbed. You see, when your mind is in perfect equanimity, serene, stable, not distracted, then that light can emerge and we can see it, we can perceive it, and we can use it. But if the mind is chaotic, full of doubts and worries and thoughts and concerns, fears, pride. That light can't work. We can't even see it. We can't sense it. So we need concentration. We need a mind that's stable. We need equanimity. In Chinese, it's called mo chao. Sanskrit, it's called pratyahara or shamatha. In Tibetan, it's called shine. This is Calm abiding, one-pointed mind in Zen terms. This is a kind of mind that is at perfect peace. Not mechanical, not reactive, receptive, open, empty, at peace, serene. We don't have a mind like that. And so to cultivate that, to rediscover that state of mental stability, we need ethics, the first training. So the three trainings are ethics, concentration, and wisdom. In the West, we tend to skip ethics. And actually, this is true in the East also. 
we human beings think, well, I know ethics says don't kill and don't steal, and I don't do those things, so I'm going to go on to the next step, concentration. And it's fine to practice concentration. We need that. We need to practice that. But the foundation of spirituality is not in concentration. It's in ethics. In fact, there's a tantra that says this. Let me see if I can find it. There's a tantra that's called the tantra requested by Subahu. And it says this. Just as every harvest grows without fault and dependence upon the earth, so too do the highest virtues depend on ethical discipline and grow by being moistened with the waters of compassion. It's very common now for us to find people, probably some of us, who think that the heights of religion and spirituality can be reached by adopting practices, behaviors, such as mantra repetition, sexual transmutation, meditation, right? We all have this concept that if I do this practice hard enough and for enough time, then I will incarnate my being, I will incarnate Christ, I will become a saint or a prophet or a Buddha. This is wrong view. This is a wrong way of thinking. It is a delusion. And the reason is, the practice itself does not bring God into your mind. Doing a mantra, doing a rune, Doing a meditation practice does not bring God. What brings God, Christ, the Buddha, realized is a pure mind. Ethics. Discipline in psychology is what brings that presence into us. And this can be easily proven. You may have had your own experience of working very hard in a given practice for days, weeks, months, even years, and look back and say, what did I gain from that? And this is a cause for many people to abandon spirituality altogether. They may have entered into a given school that says, if you do this practice for an hour or two hours every day, within such and such period of time, you will awaken your Kundalini or you will awaken your chakras, or you will see God face to face, etc. Many promises. Some even say, if you do this given practice for six months, you will create your astral body. We've heard every kind of promise you can imagine. And the people, innocent students, hear these promises, adopt these practices, work very hard and diligently for a long time, and get nothing. In the end, they receive a trauma. They receive damage in their soul. They lose faith. They develop doubt. Many abandon any effort or interest in spirituality at this point. So a grave crime has been committed. The reality is, Practices are useful and important. We need them. But what creates the fundamental change in our consciousness is not the practice. It is the ethical discipline that accompanies it, that provides the foundation for it. An example would be, if your spiritual practice, let's say you're practicing meditation, and we can say this is akin to trying to climb a mountain which is quite steep. And you make your effort to make your steps up the mountain. It's quite difficult to ascend a steep incline, especially when the environment is harsh. Like our psychological environment is very harsh and opposed to spirituality. Our society does not encourage us to cultivate our spiritual life. So we have a harsh environment. It's very difficult to go up a step or two. 
So maybe we're doing that. But then, after our meditation practice, or the whole day before, we spend the whole day trapped in our pride, feeding our anger, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, putting poisons into our body, going through our daily life filled with resentment towards others, with aggression, hostility, maybe depression. The whole range of psychological states that we experience from day to day. This is akin to turning around on that mountain and leaping downwards. Now, if you think about it, it's quite easy to leap downwards. And you can go a long way very fast, right? But it's very hard to turn around and go back up. Psychologically, this is what we do. We may have great discipline to meditate every day. We spend our 10 minutes or even an hour meditating. But what about the other 23 hours and 50 minutes of that day? What are we doing? What is the nature of our mind? What are we experiencing in our heart? What are we cultivating? What are we creating? This is the basis of Gnostic psychology. This is the entrance into the work. The entrance is facilitated by practice, transmutation, meditation, mantra, etc. It is aided by them, but it is actualized through psychology, through psychological change. In my short time in these teachings, I've observed many hundreds of different people coming in and out. Many quite enthusiastic. Some have great discipline and do a lot of practice. But outside of the time of practice, they persist in their old behaviors. And thus they change. They don't change. Eventually they leave. But I've also observed others who may not practice quite as much or diligently or regularly, but sincerely want to change their mind, their heart. Sincerely want to stop suffering from anger and anxiety and pride. Those ones do change. So ethical discipline is really the basis that we need. It is the foundation of the teaching. And that's why Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhism in general, presents that. The real foundation of all spiritual effort, spiritual accomplishment, spiritual achievement, is in ethics. The reason for it is quite simple, quite logical. When you observe a conscious, cognizant ethic in your life, you stop creating karma. It's simple. In other words, you stop creating harmful results or consequences that disturb your mind. The basic result of applying ethics from moment to moment in your life is that your mind starts to become focused. You start to be less distracted. Ethics creates a psychological environment within which you're more mindful. You're more aware of yourself. Because you realize, if I don't watch my mind, then this pride will come, this anger will come, fear, anxiety, lust. But this effort to watch the mind, to stop wrong thinking, wrong feeling, wrong action, creates an environment within which concentration becomes easy. If you don't practice ethics, then the environment only gets worse. If you're persisting in your bad behaviors, psychologically, primarily, but also physically, then your psychological environment will never be conducive to concentration, much less wisdom. And so meditation will always remain elusive to you. 
So this is why we always start with ethical discipline. To struggle against those elements in our mind that produce a distracted mind, an uneasy mind, a mind that suffers. It is through ethics that we accomplish this. So I'll read you another quote, a very useful quote. This one's from a Tibetan lama also. This quote is a uh, sounds very Gnostic. He said this, Right now, only this internal struggle with the afflictions is important. If you do not struggle with the afflictions, you will not achieve a pure ethical discipline, in which case you will not attain the concentration and wisdom that respectively suppress and uproot the afflictions. Hence, as the Buddha said, you will have to wander continually through cyclic existence. Therefore, as I explained before, once you have identified the afflictions, reflected on their faults and the benefits of separating from them, and planted the spies of mindfulness and vigilance, you must repeatedly fend off whatever affliction raises its head. Further, you must see any affliction as an enemy and attack it as soon as it arises in your mind. Otherwise, if you acquiesce when it first appears and then nurture it with further thoughts, with improper thoughts. You will have no way to defeat it, and it will conquer you in the end. It's a pretty grave warning. And it's true. The basis of this work is a profound vigilance over our own mind. A continual mindfulness of what we're doing what we're thinking, what we're feeling. And a vigilance over that to ensure that how we act, how we behave, how we think is congruent with our goal. It's very important. As an instructor, in my experience, even though it's quite limited, this is what I tend to encourage in my students. is not to so much begin right away learning a lot of practices, meditation practices, or other types of practices. These are all useful, and if someone wants that, I will help them. But my main emphasis for students is learn to watch your mind. Because from this, everything else comes naturally. Learn to watch your mind. Don't worry about all the technical details right now. And again, this Lama is agreeing with this. He's saying this is the first thing, foremost, before anything else. Learn to watch your mind. Establish this foundation. With that foundation, the rest comes naturally. Without that foundation, nothing ever will come. And so, in this tradition, we emphasize three factors. You may have heard them. Death, birth, and sacrifice. Typically, we talk about death as the death of the ego, the death of those afflictions. We talk about birth as the birth of the soul, creation, spiritually. And sacrifice is to give of ourselves to help other people. Yet these three factors are not just beautiful ideals. And they're not simple concepts. These three factors are action. Conscious action that we have to perform in ourselves. And all three factors are incorporated in each of the three trainings. Every aspect of religion True religion has these three factors. So when we apply them to ethics, we see that where we are now, we're all beginners. We're trying to receive the training on ethics, the first training. Thus, death means stop harmful action. As beginners, we can't yet 
understand how to eliminate an ego. We all have this question. How do you really eliminate an ego? And when do you know when you've eliminated an ego? And if you go around and ask students, you might have a hard time finding someone who can say, yes, I eliminated this ego and this is how it happened. Right? Might be hard to find someone who can tell you that. You know why? Because it's hard to do. And it's also because most people are skipping ethics. And so we rarely find a person who can tell you in detail how they eliminate an ego from step one to the end. The elimination of the ego can never happen without ethics, but most of all, without seeing the ego for what it is. This is death. It begins here in death to stop harmful action. In this stage, we're working with what Samael M. Vior called discovery. You see, again, Western students especially tend to think, okay, now I've heard this whole great idea about eliminating the ego, and their steps are uh, discovery, comprehension, and elimination. So how do I eliminate it? You see, they don't ask about how do I discover the ego, and they don't necessarily ask about how to comprehend the ego. They ask how to eliminate the ego. So we all have this. We want to skip to the end. You can't. Death arrives naturally when the values of a given object are exhausted. Thus, an ego will die naturally when it has no fuel. If you stop feeding the tiger, it will die. Quite simple. If you want to know how to kill your lust, stop feeding it. If you want to know how to kill your pride, stop feeding it. But in order to do that, you have to know how you feed it. And you will never know that by reading a book or by asking advice or other people's opinions. You will only see your pride when you see yourself, when you study your mind, when you study your behavior. The first training is ethics. Now, we do practice meditation in this stage of ethics. We do. This is what we've been talking about for the recent weeks. Analytical meditation. Retrospection. Whenever you have a few minutes, you sit down, you reflect on your day. You review the events that you observed in yourself, both outside and inside. And you analyze your behavior. You analyze your thoughts and your feelings. This is extremely important. I know it's not full of technical details that your intellect can really get into and sink its teeth into, because it isn't technical. It's simple. You have to review these events in your life. So when we apply the factor of death, we're stopping harmful action. Why? Because we're starting to understand something about karma cause and effect. This anger that I have in my mind only produces suffering. This lust in my mind only produces suffering. Let me stop that. This is a fundamental training that we have to give ourselves. We have to train our mind. You see, when it says the three trainings, it would be easy to think, that these are three trainings that I'm going to give to you. Nope, it isn't. It's three trainings that you give yourself. The first training, the training of ethics, you train your mind. The second training, the training of concentration, you train your mind to concentrate. And in the third, you train yourself in wisdom. No one else can give you this. No group, no master, no teacher, no book. So in that process of ethics, we start there with that death. You first have to see what is in yourself that's producing suffering and change that. And once you see it, 
You need to transform it into something that produces happiness. So what, this is why I was emphasizing in other lectures that in order for us to go further into the higher levels of the teaching, the Mahayana and Tantrayana, we need the Shravakayana, foundational level teaching which says we need to comprehend death and we need to comprehend karma. Cause and effect. Impermanence. And it's because of the ego. We need to see this envy in my mind produces suffering for myself, but also for other people. And then that sincere wish, when you feel the suffering and you see the suffering and you comprehend that, the sincere wish arises. Let me exchange this envy for altruism, for happiness for the other person. So instead of feeling, oh, I wish I had what she had, what she has now, I wish I had it. That's envy. I wish I had that nice sweater or that better life in a better country or a better place. But instead, when we see that envy, we say, no, that's wrong. And we take hold of our mind and we say, what would be the right approach? How do I apply the factor of birth? What would be the virtue here that my consciousness, my being, would really want me to express. It is to be happy for that person to have what they have. When we see that our friend won the lottery, instead of wishing we won, we say, wow, I'm so glad they won. That is so good for them. They need that. That's easy, though, in comparison with expressing that love towards an enemy. And yet Christ was able to do that. We have to be very strict with ourselves. Apply that factor of death to kill, to cancel, to eliminate the causes of suffering that emerge in us from moment to moment and exchange them, transform them into birth, the causes of happiness. Instead of being proud of ourselves, to be humble. Instead of indulging in the lust in our mind, to adopt chastity. Hmm? But none of these become possible as long as we ignore the causes of suffering. And of course, the third factor there is sacrifice. To do these things not just for ourselves, but to benefit other people. If you're a parent, start there. As a parent, you have a natural, strong love for your children. And this can be a strong impulse or motivation to apply these factors in relation with your child. If you have a spouse or you're caring for a parent, someone that you love, apply this and start learning it there. And then little by little you can expand it to include other people that you may not feel as strongly about. But when you apply this to someone you really love, it can teach you a lot. To really start to think, not to be thinking all the time from your own point of view, but to be thinking from the point of view of the other person. What do they need? What do they see? How do they suffer? And how do I make them suffer? So this entire basis of ethics, let it be very clearly understood. It is not just to do what we say. It is not just to do what God says. It is to do what is right for others. It is to do what is love. What is the most compassionate, loving, beautiful thing that you can do from moment to moment? It's never going to be for yourself. We're always thinking about ourselves. Ah, oh, it would be so compassionate and loving if I bought myself that new laptop. No. It would be more compassionate and loving for you to use that 1000 or $2,000 for something more fruitful for other people, for something that would benefit others, instead of thinking about ourselves all the time. So in previous lecture, we gave you examples of afflictions. 
Well, actually, not afflictions, but the ten paths of action that are explained in Buddhism. Not killing, not stealing, sexual misconduct, divisive speech, offensive speech, covetousness, harmful action, malice, wrong intent, wrong views. These steps that we outline, these are paths of action through which we create karma. All of these paths of action that the Buddha described are not egos. They're ways of behavior. So offensive speech or malice or hostility is not an ego in itself. It's an action produced by a psychological element. <coughs> we need to see the action in order to discover the element that produces that action. Again, this is a place where a lot of students get confused. Because we give lectures repeatedly talking about envy and pride and lust and gluttony. But then the students go out into their daily lives and say, okay, now I'm watching for ego and anger. Hey, don't cut me off. Don't drive in front of me. Don't get in line in front of me. And we have all these expressions of hostility not realizing that those are expressions of anger. So we're not, we don't see the behaviors in our physical lives or our dream lives. And thus we can't see the ego that's producing them. We have to study ourselves more deeply. So in this tradition we talk a lot about egos or aggregates. And every religion has different ways of presenting these psychological elements. In Christianity, we hear about the seven deadly sins. In Buddhism, we hear about the six, or six afflictions. What's important for us to understand is that each religion is describing the same thing from a slightly different point of view. All of them are valid. If you in your heart have a, have a natural affinity to Christianity, then use that teaching. Use it to help you. And if you have a natural affinity to Buddhism, use that to help you. Use that as your guide. They're both equally valid. And the same in Islam, and the same in, in the Zoroastrianism, Taoism. They all describe elements, psychological elements, that create suffering. It's as if five or six different religious saints or prophets were all in a room in a circle around an elephant. And each one would describe the elephant according to their point of view of that elephant. It would be slightly different. Same creature. So the same is true of our mind. What matters is not to memorize the list or debate about which list is better. It is to go to the elephant and get to know it. The elephant is your mind. All of the models work. All of the outlines of ego work. Same as practices of meditation. There are different ways to analyze the practice. They all work if you apply them, if you use them. So in Buddhism, we talk about six afflictions. And these would be comparable to the seven deadly sins. Very similar. The first one, potentially the most important, is ignorance. Ignorance is also in the very center of the wheel of samsara, or the bhava chakra. Ignorance. There are three animals there. A pig, a rooster, and a snake. And they represent ignorance, craving, and aversion. Or ignorance, hatred, and gluttony. Same symbol. Ignorance, anger, and gluttony. So ignorance is the first of these six afflictions. And this doesn't mean um, ignorance the way that a lot of Westerners use it now, which means to be stupid. Ignorance means to not know. To ignore. Even willingly. 
And you see in that word ignorance is I-G-N-O. That G-N-O is gnosis. Same root. When we ignore, we lack knowledge. We're trying to teach gnosis. But the gnosis that we're trying to teach is something we cannot teach. Can never be imparted in a discourse or in a book. Because real knowledge is something you experience in your consciousness. And that's because real ignorance is ignorance in your consciousness. In Buddhism, the affliction ignorance is a state of not knowing the truth about oneself. It is to fundamentally ignore the true nature of your consciousness, to lack knowledge of that, to not know your being, to not know who you truly are and why you're alive. That is ignorance. It has nothing to do with book study or learning your alphabet or learning languages or getting a PhD. That is not the type of ignorance that's being described here. It is an ignorance of the fundamental facts of existence. And all of us suffer from this because all of us are here and suffer. That is the meaning of that ignorance. The antidote to that is to learn those truths. To study. We start with studying intellectually. Learning through our mind, through our intellect, about the concepts of religion. The concepts of how nature functions. The concepts of what the consciousness is and what it means. But you won't get knowledge of that until you experience it. Memorizing, studying books is only to studying a map. You actually have to go on the steps of the map and experience those things in order to dispel ignorance. The second affliction described in Buddhism is hostility. Where in the first affliction, we suffer from ignorance. And perhaps the, the most significant um, sign of that ignorance is the way we fundamentally wrongly grasp at a sense of I. Hostility is the anger that emerges when that I is contradicted. This is a very deep thing. I'm not making this up. The Buddha taught this. Let me rephrase it. The fundamental sign of ignorance is having a lack of knowledge of oneself. And because we have that lack of knowledge, we grasp onto a sense of self that is false. The first part of that that we grasp onto is our personality, which we acquired only in this lifetime. The personality we have now is impermanent. It only is from this life. In our previous existences, we had different personalities. We lived in different cultures, different religions different times. So we have this fundamental wrong view that grasps at this sense of self. And when that sense of self is contradicted, we experience hostility. For example, if someone calls you a name, says you're a fool, especially if it's someone that you hold dear or respect, the pain you feel is immense. And what emerges out of that pain generally is hostility. It may not go outwards. We may not express it. But we may feel angry, upset. That is hostility. And that hostility is rooted in that fundamental ignorance of our true nature. And this is why Samael and Vior emphasized repeatedly, if you give no value to the words of the accuser, then it doesn't hurt you. That's an example when you're a parent and your child says, I hate you, daddy. Or you're a jerk. You laugh. 
as a child. Right? Not all the time. Some parents you know, get mad. But as an example, or if a very sick person or a very afflicted person, like a crazy person on the street, starts yelling obscenities at you, generally you can just brush it off, right? Because you know the person is suffering. If you're a nurse or a doctor, you deal with this a lot. People venting their anger and hostility at you when you know they're just sick and they don't really mean it. That same capacity, but far greater, emerges when you know more about your true nature. And this is how the great saints and prophets were able to take so much abuse from humanity and not react. Even on the cross, when they were abusing Jesus, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He wasn't angry. He had no, no hostility. He knew himself. And he knew them. So hostility is this, generally speaking, anger, um, malice that emerges from this fundamental wrong view. It also relates to attachments. We become angry and hostile when we can't get what we want or when something is taken from us that we want. And again, it's grasping, it's craving. We also get angry when things happen that we don't want to have happen. We're trying to avoid something and it happens and we get mad. You see, in the, all of these examples, you see these three creatures in the center of the wheel of samsara. Ignorance, craving, and aversion. We're always craving something that is illusion. We're always trying to avoid something that's actually an illusion. And in the middle of that, we're ignoring the true nature of how things function. If we had real knowledge of how things function in the universe, we wouldn't grasp at things out of desire. Nor would we avoid things that are unavoidable. We would have acceptance. We'd have peace. The antidote, if we're trying to work on this defect and apply the factor of death to our anger or hostility, the antidote is to cultivate patience. So when things happen in life that make us angry or upset, instead of getting more angry and frustrated, we have to cultivate patience. And there's a traditional prayer in the West called the Serenity Prayer. It's very effective at helping us transform these types of events. And the prayer says something like, God, give me the serenity to recognize the things that I cannot change, to change the things that I can. Right? Something like that. And the wisdom to know the difference, yeah. You see, that comes from a prayer, from remembering God. In the, I believe it was in the book, The Major Mysteries, Samael and Beor says, the true initiate places all of his longings into the hands of his innermost. For me, that statement has changed my life. Those few little words. Because now when I feel disappointment or frustration or a craving for something and I feel that frustration, I'm trying to change a situation in my life, for example. Maybe I'm sick or I'm having trouble with a person or with economics, something like that. My t traditional habit was to get more and more frustrated and upset and it creates stress and anxiety and anger and I get snappy with people and I make everybody around me miserable because of my own misery. But with that line that Samael and Bior wrote, I remember that, and then I pray. I pray to my being, and I say, you know what I need, and I accept what you give me. And from that, there's great serenity. Great acceptance. It helps me a lot to deal with pride, with hostility, so cultivating patience 
is the antidote. The third in Buddhism is attachment or craving. Attachment can be towards anything. Truly, this is a place where we can see how very creative our ego can be because it can get attached to the most profound and the most ridiculous things. Craving. Desire. This is the way we typically think of desire. Attachment. We become attached to our image, to how people see us, to how they talk about us. We become attached to objects, to people, to places, to ideas, to politics. We become attached to everything we see, everything we think, everything we feel, because we don't comprehend them. As usual, in all these, these afflictions, it's rooted in ignorance. We don't realize the true nature of a given thing. We forget karma. We forget our being. We forget impermanence. We become attached, and thus we suffer. We crave so much to get something, a situation, a spouse. We get it, and then we suffer. And then we crave to keep it. A spouse or a child is a profound example. First, we were craving to have it. And then when we get it, we're craving to keep it. But the child grows up. The spouse ages, gets sick, dies. That craving produces enormous suffering. That attachment. If we had knowledge, if we did not have ignorance, then our knowledge would remind us, well, this is all impermanent anyway. These relationships with child and spouse are not merely of this life. They go far beyond. When you have real knowledge, you have knowledge of death. And then you have no fear of death. You have no craving or attachment to this body, to this life. You know the body will die. There's freedom in that, serenity. You also know your spouse will die. There's freedom in that knowledge. Because you know you will always love them. You will always have them. You will always see them, whether in this body or out of this body. The fears we have, the anxieties we have, the attachments we have, are rooted in fundamental ignorance. We ignore the truth. We're terrified of death because we don't know what's there. We have ignorance. Let me tell you, there's no need to be afraid of death. You've already died millions of times. Millions of times. Why be afraid of that? It's like being afraid of going to sleep and waking up. It's the same thing. When you die, it's like going to sleep. There's only a little difference. The cord is cut. And you take it into the body. What you have to fear is suffering. And the funny thing is, we're creating suffering every day. And we don't fear that. We don't fear the consequences of the anger, the hostility, the craving that we're cultivating and indulging in every day. From moment to moment. That is a fundamental ignorance. That we are creating suffering that we inevitably will deal with later. Don't fear death. Fear the results of your action. Not just physically, but in your mind. Fear the consequences of what you do. And do what is right. And that way, you don't need to have fear. This uh, attachment craving is one of these three creatures in the center of the wheel of samsara. Because it is attachment that spins the wheel. 
ignorance provides the, the foundation or ground upon which that wheel can spin. Because we ignore our true nature, we forget karma, we forget impermanence, we ignore dependent origination, and these fundamental laws of matter and energy. The conditions are created so that that wheel of suffering can spin. The wheel of suffering basically means cause and effect that repeats. It's a cycle. We experience it every day. We wake up in the morning, we begin to go through our day, and we repeat ourselves. The vast majority of the things that we think and feel, we thought and felt before. The only difference is those things tend to get a little heavier, a little more dense. If you're an older person, you know the truth of this. As you get older, the mind gets more rigid, more stuck in its ways, stubborn. When you're young, the mind is very elastic, flexible. But as you get older, it gets more and more stuck. That wheel spins on that basis of ignorance, ignoring the nature of the wheel itself and our true nature. But also because craving, running after things that are illusions, make it spin. Our attachment towards social status. Because we ignore that we will die and that we can't take anything with us, we work so very hard every day to save money to get money, to get status, to get fame. For what? On any given moment, on any given day, death will come, and all of that will have been wasted. It often is. The lawyers take it. The government takes it. Ungrateful children take it. What's the point? Do you realize how hard we work? For what? To scratch out a living and then die. What is all our time spent on and why? It's this attachment that spins the wheel. Attached to having a family. Always chasing that. And in the end, are they really grateful? Do they really benefit? Are they free of suffering? How many parents get to later age and their children forget them, abandon them, put them in homes where they don't have to be dealt with, move them out of the house because they're irritating? Hundreds of thousands of old people are dealing with that right now. They spent their whole lives working so hard for their families only to be stuck in a home and abandoned very common. This is not an isolated incident. It's an institution. We cause that. And it's because of attachment and ignorance. We have to find these factors in ourselves. What are we attached to? What are we chasing after? What are we spending all our time and energy on? These are profound questions. We have a given amount of time and energy during the week. What do we spend it on? What will be the results of that expenditure? Cause and effect. Very simple. If you look at your life as a series of values, numbers, you've got a hundred percentage Right? 100%. And you start dividing up that percentage into how you spend your time. Well, right away you take out 50% because you spend that sleeping. Right? In bed. So half of your life is gone right there. And then you divide the rest of it. Each person's a little different, right? But probably 30 to 40% is spent worrying about food and eating. Right? 
And then what about the rest of that? Most of it is work, money, family, taking care of our house, taking care of our responsibilities, and watching television or surfing the Internet. And then on the very end, last, we may have a half a percent to study a little spirituality, maybe do a little spiritual practice every once in a while. So if you take all of those and reduce them to numbers, where would the greatest consequences be? If that was reduced to numbers, a mathematical equation, and you just boiled it down to get the sum, what's going to come out with the most power? The most force to impel your future? Only you can answer that. And only you can change it. But it's all driven by these afflictions. To transform attachment, the antidote to attachment is acceptance. It is to realize the nature of the truth, impermanence, karma. It is to transform the way you see the object of attachment, to meditate, to analyze the impermanence of it, the cause and effect of it, and to remember God, remember your being. In these ways, you can transform that attachment so that it doesn't afflict you like it did before. The fourth is pride. There is no greater threat to your spiritual work except maybe lust. Pride is the greatest danger. This is what Song Kapa said. He said it's the chief obstacle to development spiritually. Pride. Pride, quickly defined, is to have an inflated view of yourself or a false view of yourself. We usually think of pride as um, somebody with a puffed-out chest who's always up in the front of the group trying to get attention, thinking they're a big shot, right? Thinking they're better than others. Yes, this is pride, but it isn't the only form of pride. The person who rejects the group who says, I'm better than them, also suffers from pride. The person who says, you see how humble I am, that is pride. Or, I'm worse than all of you, that's pride. Shame is the opposite pole of the one who struts around like a rooster. The one who slinks into the corners is also suffering from pride. Every psychological element has this essential polarity. If we talked about the seven deadly sins, we talked about envy, or we talked about greed, for example, we tend to think of greed as people who hoard, right? But properly stated, greed is really a kind of wastefulness. And so the ones who waste money suffer the same defect, but in its opposite face. The ones who waste resources. Instead of being a miser and hoarding it, they're a spendthrift. They spend money without thinking about the consequence. They waste resources. Laziness also. One of the seven deadly sins, the first Laziness. We always think of it's just someone lying on a couch watching TV all day long. Yeah, that's lazy physically. But real laziness is conscious laziness. Someone who pays no attention to themselves consciously. That's all of us. We're asleep. That person physically could be extremely active. 
always running from event to event and thing to thing. I'm so busy. I got to go here and there. I got a busy schedule and I can't talk to you. We think, wow, they're really diligent. No, they are completely lazy, 100% asleep. And this is the most popular way to live life now. You see that? It's not the one we put billboards up about. That's going to the beach and just being retired and living on a boat or in a hammock. The one that everybody celebrates and admires nowadays is the one who's so super busy that they have no time for you, no time for anything. We admire that. We think, wow, they're really on top of it. They're doing a lot. They're really going somewhere. No, they are asleep. You know the person that's got two phone calls going at the same time and they're writing an email and they've got people coming in waiting for a meeting? That type of situation? It's everywhere. It is not diligence. It is laziness. They have no awareness at all of what they're doing. No consciousness. That is laziness. So every ego has that. Pride is no exception. Pride is that inflated view. The antidote to pride, when you observe pride in yourself, when you discover pride in yourself, remember death. Remember that. And remember this. Even if you're a great spiritual aspirant, and you're having all kinds of experiences, and you're zooming to God in your path, even Jesus died. Even Buddha died. Even Krishna died. Even Moses died. You will die. What have you to be so proud of? Remember illness, remember aging, remember death. These are a great antidote to pride. And remember your being. The reality is we are just specks of dust on the mirror of the universe. The fifth is doubt. Doubt is very subtle. This applies to having doubt about our being, about God. We all may have a, enough of a spiritual longing to try to answer the riddle in ourselves. Who or what is God? Who or what is that? But surrounding that impulse, that urgency, is an enormous cloud of doubt. And that is a chief affliction. I think Westerners are usually surprised to hear this, that doubt in Buddhism is put up there the way we put pride and envy and lust and greed. And this is because doubt can take you out of the path very easily. It doesn't just mean an intellectual doubt or the thought of doubt. We prove it in our actions. We may, not, we may proclaim to have great faith in God, for example, or great faith in the teachings. We may say, there's no doubt that cause and effect is real and that the, true, the Dharma is real and Gnosis is the real deal and I've got my being and there's no doubt about Samael and Vior and all these things. We can proclaim that and we can be a big shot instructor or whatever. But the proof that doubt as an affliction exists within us is in our very actions because we persist in behaving poorly. We still have anger. We still have pride. And when we have those elements in our mind and we allow them a sliver of room to exist in our mind stream, for example, we feel a little resentment for someone and we allow ourselves to feel that resentment or we feel a little envy for someone and we allow that to be there, it proves unquestionably 
that the affliction of doubt is alive in us because in our actions, we still do not realize cause and effect. We still don't realize that that anger is going to produce suffering and binds us to the wheel of samsara, binds us to suffering. So doubt is not simple. Doubt is not dispelled by proclaiming faith or by raising our hands to God and saying, I believe, now I'm saved. This does not dispel doubt. Doubt is dispelled when our every action is in accordance with the law. That shows that doubt is gone. The sixth is wrong views. And this includes a wide variety of uh, concepts and theories and behaviors related with religion. Primarily, it's related with the Eightfold Path and right view. Right view is a form of cognizant perception that sees the nature of the truth. In other words, it's a way of being conscious of oneself spontaneously, intuitively, without thought, that sees the truth, that sees reality. That is right view. True right view is the full embodiment of wisdom, prana. And until we get there, we have a lot of wrong views. Wrong views include the other afflictions. We have wrong views of ignorance, of hostility, of attachment, of pride, of doubt. These are all wrong views. But other wrong views are wrong views we have about religion, about life, about ways of behaving. A key example would be a very strong and difficult wrong view is the belief that if I just adopt this new religion or this way of behaving, I will be liberated. And so everybody in the world suffers from this. They hear about the Catholic religion and say, oh, if I believe in Jesus and I become a Catholic, then I'm going to go to heaven. I'm saved. That is wrong view. No one is saved by belief. They're saved by action. And the Bible says it. We're proven by our works, by the quality of mind that we have. The same is true in Buddhism. People say, oh, if I believe in this Lama and I become a student of this Rinpoche, if I begin to follow this teacher or become a disciple of this school, then I'm on my way to liberation. I'll become an Arhat. Wrong views. The Gnostics suffer this also. If I belong to this group, then I'm on the express train to God. If I belong to this group or follow this teacher, and if I do this and that practice, then I will be saved. Wrong view. It's wrong. The practice doesn't save us. Practices do not save us. Your quality of mind does. The quality of your soul, your ethics. And there are groups out there that teach, if you do this certain meditation practice or these mantras a hundred thousand times or a million times or three or four hours a day, there's no doubt you will reach liberation. This is all wrong view. It's fundamentally wrong. It has total incongruence with karma, cause and effect. The repetition of a mantra can allow you the insight or experience of nirvana. You can see nirvana. You may experience a type of awakening. You may see God, but it will not liberate you. And this is a mistake that many yogis have fallen into. Many great teachers have fallen into this error and teach how to repeat what they experienced. So you can experience the same thing they did. And I'm talking about people that you all know about, but I don't want to name any names. There are a lot of them that state, if you do this practice every day, seriously, for such and such time, you will experience God. And yeah, it's true. You will. But you won't be liberated. Because in your mind exist all of these faults. Because instead of working on your ethics and changing your psychology, you spend all your time trying to get something through craving. Do you realize that? Craving, which produces suffering. 
It's very important that you properly manage your spiritual inquietude and your longing to know God. Don't let it become an ego. Don't let it become a craving. And don't let those experiences become pride. And don't let the lack of them become doubt. You see, these afflictions are extremely powerful. We suffer because we have them. And we stop suffering when we end them. So we need to apply the antidotes from moment to moment, from day to day, from event to event. We have to learn how to transform our actions. These lectures up till now, we've been talking about the foundational level of the path, Srivakayana teachings. To remind you, they are concerned with ethics, with karma, with impermanence, with death. Working at this level, we apply those teachings to our experience from moment to moment. So when we are back in our daily life after this lecture, when you don't have to act like a good Gnostic, when you're back in your normal life and you're trying to act like everybody else in life, you have to learn to apply these techniques. When you observe in your mind fear, when you feel in your heart a feeling of superiority to someone else, don't wait. Fight that immediately. Transform it. Remember your being and look at that element in yourself and say, do I really want this? When you catch yourself experiencing lust, either as an imagination or through your eyes or through any sense, remember yourself. Look at that element and analyze it. What will this element produce? Be very scientific. If I let this element use my energy, what will be the effect? What will be the consequence? Analyze it. Don't just avoid it. Don't just run away from it. Analyze it in that instant. If I let this lust process in me and, and use this energy in me, what will be the result of it? What will be the consequence? What will happen? Furthermore, how can I transform it? If I don't want those consequences, then how do I get the consequences that I do want? How do I transform that? So let's take an example of of avarice or uh, altruism, this polarity. We work really hard in our lives. We all do. Maybe not physically, but intellectually and emotionally, we expend a great deal of energy heading towards some goal that we have, whatever that goal happens to be. We need to analyze that goal and determine if our actions are really congruent with the result we, achieve, we want to achieve. Moreover, we have to do it in the moment. Let's say, for example, we have worked hard in our job 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week for years trying to gather together some savings. And we want to do good with it. So we're walking down the street and we see a homeless person and we feel that compassion for them and want to help them. This is a beautiful longing. Most of us would, without really thinking about it much, give them a little money. But we haven't analyzed the consequences of that action. You see, we would think, I'm being compassionate. I'm doing a good work. I'm doing a good deed. But are you really? You have to measure. Be sincere. What if that person is an alcoholic? What if that homeless person is a drug dealer or a drug addict? What are they going to use the money for? It would be better for you in that instance if they're asking for money for food to say, yeah, I'll buy you a meal. Let's go to this place right over here and I'll buy you a meal. I'll feed you. Or I'll take you to the soup kitchen. They'll feed you. But you know what they'll all say? I know because I've done it. 
No, 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 no. I need the money for the bus. Okay, I'll buy you your bus ticket. No, 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 no. I, I, I got to get it myself. I can't get it till tomorrow. They give you all kinds of excuses because they're lying. They're lying, and they're really good liars because we all are. We're experts. You have to be very cautious, even when you think you're doing good. Are you really doing good? Let me give you another example. Let's say you were going to give that person 10 bucks, $10. What would they do with it, right? They might go buy alcohol or drugs, something. Something to hurt themselves or to hurt someone else. What if you gave that $10 to a charity? Think about the consequences of that action. What if you gave that $10 to a student who really needed it for a book? What if you gave it to someone who was sick and needed medicine? What if you gave it to someone who really needed Gnosis or the Dharma? Compare the results of all these actions and look at the karma. Look at, if I perform this action, this is likely to happen. If I perform action B, this is likely to happen. And then you choose. What is the most effective way for me to reach my goal? Now, in the Shravakiana level, which we're talking about at the beginning, the concern is generally first with ourselves. We have to change our mind, change ourselves. And so most schools at this level are not really too concerned with other people. They may talk about compassion and love, but the focus is generally first on changing ourselves and helping ourselves to become better. Right, to stabilize the mind. This is important and good. But there is a higher way. There is a superior way. And it's called Mahayana. In the Mahayana example, we would apply this example story. And in that instant of saying, well, am I going to give him my $10? The Shravakiana person would say, how is that going to affect me? And this is important. We need to think that way. Yeah, how will it affect me? If it's going to hurt me, I don't know if that's a good thing. But the second stage is, how is it going to affect him? Now, we think we're doing good, but are we really? And if we question it, we'll say, really, this probably will be bad for him because he'll persist in his habit, his addiction. This is where we start to think about the effects of our actions on other people. This is the entrance into Mahayana. The Gnostic teaching goes way beyond Mahayana. It is Shravakayana, it is Mahayana, but it is also Tantrayana, which is beyond. At this level, to fully transform the event, you have to take yourself out of it. But most of us haven't received, we haven't trained ourselves enough to work in that way. As an example, you would say, you would immediately see, well, this is going to hurt me if I give him the $10. It's going to hurt him if I give him the $10. But if I take that $10 and I give it to my master, to my teacher, or if I give it to a great lama or somebody who's really doing a lot to help humanity, the impact is magnified beyond calculation. Far beyond calculation. That is a very Mahayana or even Tantrayana way of thinking. We have to apply that in everything. How we think, how we act, what we do. Not only how it affects us or the person we're dealing with, but everybody else. We have a given job in life. We fulfill a role in society. 100% of the time, or 99.997% of the time, we only think about our job in relation with ourselves, right? How much we suffer, how much we hate it, how much we drag our feet, how much we're abused, how much we're underpaid. It's all about me. It's all about I, pride, ignorance. The first step would be, if you really want to transform that 40 to 80 hours a week you spend of your energy, instead of thinking about yourself all the time, Think about your coworkers 
or the client that you're serving. If you can transform that job and say, how am I serving them? Am I really doing a good job? Not just from what my boss says so I get recognition, but from what the person I'm serving says. Am I really serving them? Is my job a spiritual practice? That is a Mahayana approach. And it's hard. Let me promise you that. It is hard. Because our ignorance and our craving and our pride and our doubt and our wrong views and our hostility are all very strong. Especially at work. Because we expend an enormous amount of energy in our jobs. So then we need to look at this. Why do I have the job I have? To benefit whom? If you're picking between two jobs, how do you pick? Let's say you have two offers. You're one of those rare people nowadays who has two offers for a job. How do you pick? Well, most of us would say, oh, the one that has the most money. <laughs> of course. Easy. No. If you're practicing Shravakayana, you're going to look at how the karma will affect you. If you're practicing Mahayana level, you'll look at how that job affects other people. Is that a good company? Is the job good? Does it really contribute to people, to other people? Not to me, because I'm going to work hard either way. To others. Does it contribute to society? Does it provide something of benefit? Now, I'm not telling all you guys to go out and change your jobs. I'm not saying that. What I'm suggesting is to learn to transform your way of thinking. You see... The Shravakayana level teachings where you're working on yourself is very good and helpful, but it's very limited. The real power of spirituality, when it's founded in the ethical discipline, only emerges when your way of thinking is concerned about the well-being of other people. And when you start to think that way, your religious life will be 100% transformed. Think about it. It's logical. If you're a parent and you have two kids, and the one child is always just doing for themselves, they don't help in the house, they don't help anybody, they're only worried about getting for them. They're always coming to you saying, Mom, I want this, I want that. But the other child is always helping, is always cleaning, is always helping the others. Which one are you going to reward? Which one is going to be more valued? Which one is going to be more loved? Which one will have a better life? The answer is obvious. Yet none of us live that way. We live like the spoiled child. Because we always go to God saying, God, I want this and I want that. Please. And we don't do anything to clean our house, our psychological house. And we don't do anything to help others. We're always just trying to feed and help ourselves. To help our attachment, to feed our pride, to express our hostility. You see, we have a parent. But that parent, our innermost is not like a terrestrial parent. Far beyond. Our innermost respects the law. Works with cause and effect. If we do too, we will receive the effects that we deserve. If we want experiences in meditation, if we want wisdom, if we want spiritual development, we need to establish a profound practice of ethical discipline. From that, everything else comes. I'm going to stop there and let you ask questions, if you have any, unless I scared you all. Yeah? Um, in your own life, how do you go about every day of recognizing thoughts in, in yourself and then identifying what that is and then um, finding a way of combating it? You know, what techniques do you use and stuff that work for you? Okay. The way that we learn to fight or battle against the afflictions. But even just to, just to even just like be aware that it's there. Right, in the moment. It's, it's a very intuitive practice.
process because it's a cognizant or conscious process. It's not intellectual. I've seen and read many different intellectual descriptions of that and outlines and structures that people try to memorize. But the reality is you just need to establish the first step, mindfulness. You need to be aware of what you're doing at all times. That's just to be mindful from moment to moment of what you're doing. This is the, the basis for meditation, the basis for any spiritual experience. And that's ethics is summarized in that mindfulness. You can also call it vigilance. It's to be like a soldier who's watching for the enemy to arrive. We have to have that degree of attentiveness over our psychology because we do have an enemy. But the enemy is inside. The enemy is our own mind. From that attentiveness, the rest unfolds naturally. Because once you become aware of, you see an element or a defect in yourself, then intuitively you learn how to battle them, how to combat them. There's no simple answer to this. And that's because the afflictions, the egos in us, are so radically diverse. There's no one antidote that will work in every case. So Samael and Vior described this as a process of psychological judo. And he explained that what we know of as judo in the physical world is simply the shadow of a technique that was originally taught to monks in order to work on their mind. We all admire judo because it's a beautiful art. But really, it comes from a psychological art. And the basis of that technique is that you use your opponent's energy against him. So we do the same thing psychologically. You see, in physical judo, you learn when someone attacks you, you take that energy that's directed at you and you redirect it back at your opponent. In that sense, even a very weak person or a child or an older person who doesn't have much energy can fight a much stronger opponent. And this is definitely the case with us, with our mind. We are David and we're fighting Goliath, a huge giant. So this technique allows us, first, we become aware of the element. Whatever that is, if it's lust or pride or envy, we have to see that. Oh, okay, I see that. That awareness alone begins to redirect that energy, provided we sustain the awareness. Don't make the mistake of, okay, I, I see that pride now, and then we go off and get distracted again. Or we start intellectualizing about that element. Those are mistakes. You have to remain continually vigilant. Those elements arise. They might sustain themselves for a while, but they will pass. You have to remain cognizant, watchful of yourself throughout that process. And then later, could be immediately after or later when you have time to reflect, you replay that and analyze that and look at it and analyze it with these tools, karma, impermanence, remembering the being, looking at the cause and effect. These are the basic tools in the beginning. You can also use the law of opposites. This is a cause for some um, confusion, I think, with some students, but the Master Samael taught what's called the jewels of the yellow dragon. And these are related techniques to the psychological judo where you take the opposites and you work with them. So if you feel lust for a person, then the way you can apply the antidote is to say, well, this person that is so beautiful now is really just a walking corpse in reality. I wouldn't feel lust for them if they were dead, right? But they're going to die, so why should I feel lust? Moreover, this person that I feel lust for is carrying around inside of that little thin layer of skin all kinds of things I would never feel lust for. Blood and mucus and phlegm and all kinds of filthy things. So why would I feel lust for them? Or why would I feel lust for this person when really they're just like my sister or my mother or my brother or my father who I would not feel lust for? So why should I feel lust for this person? You see, so you use these polarities to teach the mind, to discipline your mind, to say, no mind, I'm not going to let you use my energy that way. 
I'm going to be conscious of my energy. So there are many techniques that you can apply, but all of them are rooted in cognizance, watchfulness. Any other question? In the back? Wow, you guys are in trouble because this person wants a six-hour lecture today. Uh, but I have compassion on you, so I won't do that to you. Um, there are many examples that you can study about the polarities of the ego, but they're going to be individual in each person. So what I would recommend is that you start to look at yourself. The thing here is do not just label these elements in your mind. When you see something in yourself, you'll feel if it's wrong. If you're really paying attention and sincere, you can feel it. You will know. You will know because you have a conscience. You see, you have to listen to the conscience. It's that element of your consciousness that can tell the difference between right and wrong. That's what matters. It doesn't matter if you say, oh, okay, this is, I see this thing in myself. What is that? Is that anger or is that pride? Or I'm not sure what name. Maybe I'll call my instructor. Maybe he'll know. No, 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 no. This is not the right way to do it. The way to approach it is to say, why is this wrong? Why? If you just put a label, you'll end up lazy. And I'll tell you, frankly, that I have watched this with hundreds of people. Hundreds. Who will see an element of lust and go, oh, yeah, that's lust. I see it. Yep. And that's all they do. They just put a label on it. But the lust is still processing in themselves, and they don't comprehend why it's harmful to them or to other people. They don't analyze. Don't stop with the label. Analyze. And let me give you an example of why. I'll try to be brief. Let's say, for example, that you feel anger. And you say, God, I feel so angry. It'd be easy to say, okay, well, that's my ego of anger, so now I'm going to meditate on my ego of anger. But what is that going to really get you? What's better is to do this. Why am I angry? Why? Was it because my spouse said that I was an idiot for making that decision? And my pride was hurt? Okay, so now we're not talking about just anger. We're talking about pride. But if I just leave the labels, I won't go into the depths of that either. So why was my pride hurt? Because I want to be a big shot? Because I want everybody to admire and respect me? Because I want my wife to treat me a certain way? Or my spouse to treat me a certain way? Why? Because I have self-esteem? Is it because I have fear that I'll be rejected? Is it that I have fear that she'll go with someone else? You see, all of these elements are interconnected. No psychological, no psychological element works alone. When you've identified... <clears throat> when you've identified... Sorry, they're digging into the bagels back there. When you have identified an element in yourself, let me give you a word of warning. They never act alone. Never. No ego is by itself. They always have their buddies. Always. The egos work in groups. So when you see anger, that anger is being fed by something else. Pride, attachment, lust, Envy, craving, aversion, something. And that in turn is being fed by something else. So if you go around and just putting labels on everybody, you might put name tags on your egos, but you won't understand what they're doing or why it's wrong. You have to analyze them and get at the roots. Who's feeding who? How are these functioning in your mind? How are these different elements manipulating your behaviors? It's very sophisticated. Your mind is extremely complex. 
That's why the intellect cannot resolve it. We study with the intellect in the beginning to learn about these teachings, to learn the structures of our soul and the structures of the universe and, and something in general about the mind. But to really get in there and change the mind, you cannot do it with the mind. You cannot do it with intellect or labels. The only way to change it is through the consciousness, which is intuitive. The consciousness doesn't need to memorize. Pride has A, B, C, D, E, G, you know, all these different examples of how pride can act. The consciousness just says, oh, yeah, that's pride. I can taste it. I can sense it. I can feel it. That is cognizant, intuitive. And then it can say, oh, I feel that that pride is somehow related to that lust. Or I can feel that that pride is somehow related to that aversion. So only your heart, your intuition, can navigate those complex paths and reveal them to you, only intuitively. And I've seen many schools try to build elaborate diagrams of the ego and how it functions. Those things always fail. The ego is way more clever than any diagram you can make. And the only one that can outsmart your ego is your innermost. Think on that. If you've been in suffering in the cycle of existence for however many uncountable number of lifetimes, do you really think that you can unravel it? You're the one who made all the problems, right? We create our own suffering. We're in this mistake, in this problem, in this life because of our own action. We have to initiate the process of changing it. But the only one who can lead us out is the one who is not trapped in it. Remember Ariadne's thread? You ever hear that story? The Greek myth? Yeah. When the hero, is it Theseus or Perseus? I think it's Theseus, is going to descend into the labyrinth to kill the Minotaur the only way he can navigate it and make sure he gets in and out is because his divine mother gives him a thread of gold that he uses to keep his path so he won't get confused. That thread of gold is the consciousness in continuity. Continual self-awareness, observance, mindfulness. That is the thread. That gold is your energy, transmuted, purified used consciously. And you can use that to navigate through the labyrinth of your mind in order to get at the heart and kill the beast. One last question? In the back. Can you repeat the first part of that question again? I don't know if I understood that. In the scriptures, the term renewing of the mind is written. Which scripture? I don't know. Ask that, which scripture that's in. And then about the mental body. Does the mental body have an impact on ethics? Absolutely. There's no question about that. To create a solar mental body initiates a profound change in the psychology of an initiate. Firstly, because in order to reach the level of creating a solar mental body, you must first have created a solar astral body. And as Samael and Vior explained in his book, The Seven Words, the only way you can create a solar astral body is if you have broken all of your commitments to the Black Lodge. You see, our ego exists. It has power. It has energy because of cause and effect. Because we have in our mind impurities, defects, errors, vices, and those all belong in the realm of klipot, hell, what we call the Black Lodge. It is our subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infraconsciousness. To create the solar astral body requires that we break contracts, cause and effect, karma. We have to break ties. We have to make a commitment a very serious commitment to those ties. Only in that way 
can we then go on later to create the solar mental body? So in other words, what I'm saying is, before you can have a mental body, you need an astral body. And to have an astral body, you need strong ethics. Once you have those strong ethics established, then your astral body can be made, completed, and then you can go on to create the mental body. These two in combination give you incredible uh, skill and facility in going deeper into the ego. They're a great aid because they are vessels that belong to God. They are superior vehicles or superior aspects of mind. And the, the definitive characteristic that they provide is a profound intuition. They are related with the abstract mind, with the kind of understanding that you can acquire because those bodies act as mirrors that reflect the, the con contents of any given phenomena. So someone who meditates on their ego, who doesn't have those bodies, cannot see as much. Someone who has those bodies can see more. The other part of that question was what? The scriptures, yeah, in James he talks about the renewal and also in other places in the Gospels. But renewing the mind is a concept that's not unique to Christianity. It's also present in Buddhism and Hinduism. And from my understanding, the basis of that concept is that the term mind there is not the same way that I'm using it. Mind in this context would be uh, more akin to consciousness. So... For example, in Buddhism, when they talk about mind, they're usually talking about consciousness. So if you read a Buddhist scripture or a Hindu scripture, you have to be careful about the translation and how they're using the terms. When we say renewing the mind, yes, we need to renew the mind. The mind... Hmm? Well, the mind relates to many sephra. Buddhi, Bina, Tifret, Netza, Hod. All of them have relations with the mind and how the mind functions. Renewing that means cleansing it through ethics. So, another question back here I saw? Did you? Oh, okay. Anything else? Um, one more back here. Okay. Um, it is said to meditate upon the ego, to comprehend it. Would it not be better to study and comprehend, comprehend the polarizing virtue and be mindful to practice that way, thereby strongly? So the question is about studying the polarizations of the ego so that you're aware of the virtue and learning to practice that virtue. Yes, I agree there's some value in that, in the same way that a child learns how to write the alphabet by studying the letters and writing them over and over. You, you gain a certain facility for what those letters are and how they work. So I agree, and that's why we read scripture. We read scriptures and stories of masters and saints in order to see how virtue functions and what real virtue is. But it's not enough. If you want to speak the language of the spirit, you have to be cognizant of it, not merely repeat it. So it's good to study the scriptures, to study how the different religions present defects or afflictions and upright action. We need to know those things. But you cannot practice them. You have to live them. You have to be them. When you say practice them, it's as if you're implying that you will superimpose over yourself a model or a template. As if to say, I shouldn't wear this red shirt of anger, I should put on a white shirt of patience. Well, this is a fine intention, but it doesn't change what is inside the shirt. It sounds subtle, maybe, but the difference is in what's in your heart. What you're doing from your heart and mind. Not merely trying to uh, imitate another behavior, but trying to sincerely do what you know and feel in your heart is right. You see the difference? You can't learn virtues through imitation. You learn them through action.
Yeah, this is, this is a good example. There are many groups that try to help addicts, for example, and they teach the addicts to adopt new behaviors through imitation. So don't go to bars, don't go here and there, don't go with these friends, and avoid these types of environments. This is good and it's important. We need that. As a Gnostic, you especially need that, not to put yourself in an environment where these harmful influences will cause you to return to those behaviors. However, the behavior emerges from inside of you, not outside. If you merely modify your external behavior, you've not dealt with the, so the source of suffering. That's why those elements will resurge again later stronger because they've been processing in the submerged aspects of the mind. And this is why we see Gnostics, monks, nuns, priests all over the world who go into a religion, adopt that religion, believe everything, and begin to act like someone in that religion, but they suppress they bury and avoid all of those elements in themselves. They don't deal with it. And later, they break. They snap. And those elements come out even stronger. Very sad. We can't afford to make that mistake. The Buddha said something very interesting, and I'll end it with this. Someone came to the Buddha and was asking questions and talking about... Um, infractions and, and how one makes an infraction of an infliction. Like, you know, we're not supposed to act on pride, we're not supposed to act on fear, etc., etc. And what about death? And the Buddha said, if you die, it's wonderful. Because you'll just be born again. There's no problem with death. But if you perform a wrong action, it's horrible. Because it affects you not only in this life, but in your future life. So in that way, wrong action is worse than death. It's worse. Death is natural, normal. All of us will die. So this is why Joan of Arc said something that I admire very much. She said, I would sooner die than do anything I know is wrong. Strong words. She lived by it. We should do the same. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,